Good morning. I'm so glad to be able to be with you this morning in the Word of God. This morning, our topic is, Will There Be Peace on Earth? As we approach the Christmas season in just mm, a month and a half or so, we realize that the call of the world so often is for peace. Peace, peace, as the prophet Isaiah says, and there is no peace. Will there be peace on earth? In the uh, last 4,000 years of recorded history, there has been, according to some experts, about nine minutes of peace. It seems like Mankind is intent on blowing each other up, and we certainly see this taking place in the Middle East today with growing uh, calls for more and more Muslim uh, countries to get involved in the annihilation of Israel. Will there be peace on earth? There will, but there are problems that lie ahead of us, and I want to discuss those problems this morning from the book of Matthew, chapter 24. But before we do that, before we read it, let's pray together. Father, thank you so much for your word. Thank you for the people who've joined me this morning. And I pray that you would bless their hearts and encourage their hearts, Lord, as we know that there is peace ahead. But there are also problems. And we know the Savior, so we can rest our feet uh, and rest our hearts in the hands of our Lord Jesus as we await your coming. Lord, help us be faithful until you come. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, I want to turn your attention to the book of Matthew, chapter 24. It's a big passage of scripture. We're not going to read the whole text. But um, it does give an answer to those who say, you know, Lord, is your coming uh, soon? It says, Jesus left the temple and was going away when his disciples came to point out to him the buildings of the temple. But he answered them, you see all these, do you not? Truly, I say to you, there shall be, there shall not be left here one stone upon another that will not be thrown down. Now, this took place in 70 AD when Rome uh, came and just leveled Jerusalem. Now, this was prophesied, but we also know that Jesus now speaks about the end of time and the coming of his kingdom, and this was not in reference to these uh, buildings that were present at the time of ministry of Jesus. And he sat on the Mount of Olives. The disciples came to him privately saying, tell us, when will these things be? What will be the sign of your coming and the end of the age? So when Jesus prophesied about the buildings being destroyed in Jerusalem, he wasn't talking about the end of the age. He was talking about the fact that, that all of Israel had put their trust in the temple. And they were not putting their trust in the one who is the living God, who came uh, to fill up the temple in the Old Testament, was now with us explaining and being that perfect uh, son of God to to men and women so he could share with them how they might know the living God in a personal way. So anyways, he goes on to say, uh, See that no one leads you astray, for many will come in my name, saying, I am the Christ, and they will lead many astray. And you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you are not alarmed, for this must take place. But the end is not yet. For a nation will rise up against nation and kingdom against kingdom, and there will be famines and earthquakes in various places. All these are but the beginning of birth pangs. Do you feel the birth pangs? Every day that, that ticks by draws us closer to the return of Jesus. Then they will deliver you up to tribulation and put you to death, and you'll be hated for, by all nations for my name's sake. And then many will fall away and betray one another and hate one another. Many false prophets will arise and lead many astray. And because lawlessness will increase, the love of many will grow cold. But the one who endures to the end will be delivered. And this gospel of the kingdom will be proclaimed throughout the whole earth as a testimony to all nations. And then, then the end will come. Well, again, every time Christmas comes, people talk about peace on earth. 
And Mike, I asked you this question this morning. Do you really think that peace is possible? Do you really think that peace in the Middle East will happen as everybody's rattling their sabers at this time, uh, declaring their hatred for Israel and anti-Semitism is growing at alarming rates all around the world. Why is that? I shared the reason for that last week. It's because God had made a promise to Israel through Abraham that their a covenant promise that Abraham's offspring would live forever, would never be destroyed. Like the stars in the sky, so many would his offspring be. And then Abraham's offspring also increased as we were adopted into his family through faith in Jesus Christ. Paul tells us about that uh, later on in the book of Romans. But peace is sought for all over the world, and yet it's not found in many places. In fact, right now, there are 40 wars, probably more than 50, more about 50 wars now since the war with Israel being fought around the world. During the time of recorded history, there have been 8,000 peace treaties signed and 8,000 peace treaties broken. And how about the United Nations? I mean, their reason for existence is to create a global government or a global oversight that will establish war. Funny, though, since UN began in 1945, there has not been one day of peace on this planet. And the U.S. armed forces have become the global police, haven't they? They're placed all over the globe to help others from killing each other or blowing each other up. So much for our ability to create peace on earth. One man said, Washington, D.C. is known for its large assortment of peace monuments because we build one after every war. Will there be peace on earth? Many people don't realize this, but since the breakup of the Soviet Union uh, a number of years ago, 30, 40 years ago, 35 years ago, maybe, um, there have been 30,000 atomic warheads or nuclear bombs in suitcases that according to reports have been lost. We don't know where they're at. Hopefully they're not in the wrong hands, but it's interesting to me. Um, there are as many as, um, well, 250 miniature nuclear bombs out there. Each of these bombs has the capacity of killing about 100,000 people if detonated. Will there be peace on earth? It's hard to give an affirming yes, other than the fact that the Bible tells us that peace will come when the Prince of Peace is resident and president of the world. In fact, Jesus tells us exactly that in Matthew chapter 24 and Matthew chapter 25. The teaching of our Lord to his disciples takes place on a Wednesday, during which is now called Passion Week. Um, a few days after his triumphal entry into Jerusalem on Palm Sunday, and just a day before they celebrated the Lord's Supper on Thursday, because people from the northern part of Israel, from uh, Judea, uh, celebrated Passover on Thursday, and those in the Jerusalem area celebrated Passover on Friday. That's an interesting point I picked up even this last week. But the disciples were still clueless about the cross. They're still starstruck with Jerusalem's celebration of Jesus just a few days before. They thought the kingdom was virtually Christ to capture, to take. And as Luke 19, 11 tells us, they thought the kingdom of God would appear immediately. But Jesus let them know that there was much yet to take place on God's prophetic time clock before the kingdom would come. And my friend, there are many things that Jesus prophesied to his disciples that are still yet unfulfilled today before the literal kingdom of our Lord Jesus Christ is established on the earth. And some people say, well, it's not a literal kingdom. Yes, it is. The Bible ref refers to the kingdom of God numerous times, both in Old Testament and New Testament, and says that there is a new kingdom coming, but there is much to happen before the kingdom of God is established on the earth. Matthew 24 and 25 is a prophetic message 
that's relevant right now because I believe the stage for its fulfillment is close to being set. And it's very possible that the players are waiting in the wings for the first act to begin. Will there be peace on earth? Yes. But according to our Lord Jesus, there is bleakness before the blessing. There is terror before trans tranquility. There are problems before the peace. Stomp, the storm will come before the calm. Verse 3 says, As he sat on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately, saying, Tell us, when will these things be? When will be the sign of your coming in the end of the age? Check that phrase, end of the age. It appears five times in Matthew, and it's all used in context to mean a completed end, the time when Christ comes in ultimate final judgment upon the world. The disciples are asking, and many people are asking today, when will this be? Jesus tells them before the day arrives, the world would see, number one, false prophets, the rise of false prophets, the rise of false Christ, the rise of false saviors. And Jesus answered and said to them, take heed that no one deceives you. For many will come in my name saying, I am the Christ and will deceive many. Six times in this passage, Jesus warns his disciples about the rise of false messiahs. The rise of false anointed ones. In fact, the, the English word Christ, we have Jesus Christ or Jesus the Christ. The English word Christ is the Hebrew derivative or the Hebrew tra translated from the Hebrew of Messiah. Who is the Messiah? The Messiah was the anointed one, the promised one, who would rule and reign in the line of David over the kingdom of God. Interestingly enough, over the last 70 or so years, there have been over 1,100 religious leaders who have claimed to be the Christ and Savior of the world. Hmm. Now, Jesus tells us that the time preceding his second coming will see a rise of false teachers— continue to explode exponentially. First Timothy, I read this this morning in my quiet time, First Timothy tells us that in the last days, men shall give heed or attention to the doctrine of demons. Today, in our present culture, what's called a postmodern mindset, postmodern means you know, the, the, the answers lie in technology, and our present culture says, no, we know the answers don't lie in technology. In fact, we're scared to death of what robots and what computers are going to do through artificial intelligence. We know that the answers to life's problems are not found, don't have a scientific answer or a technological answer. There's got to be something else. We don't want God. We don't want the potential of, of repenting and listening to what God has to say about life. But we'll look somewhere else, and I'll guarantee you this, that the whole idea of being spiritual and sense of spiritual awakening and, um, and a, a, an increased interest in the demonic and the spiritual and spirits, it's running, I mean, pandemic within the context of our world culture. Witchcraft is growing exponentially around the world. Jesus said that in the last days, you will see increased false teaching, false teachers, false messiahs. Today, our younger postmodern post generation says all the talk about man's ability to think himself out of the dilemmas that we face are bogus. What science has done to stop my parents what what has science done to stop my parents from going through a divorce? What has science done to keep uh, to prevent my father from leaving the family? What has science done to protect me from addiction? What has science done to cure my heartaches of experiencing my sister's overdose? I want something deeper. And so the search for spirituality grows in the postmodern culture, but sadly. That search is often misdirected into cults, of which there are over 400 in the United States. 
or the occult, which I've already stated is exploding with growth. But Jesus said, don't be frightened. Why? Jesus told us this would happen. He told us deception would increase as the end of the age draws near. Be on the alert, Paul writes. Why? Because the devil prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. We need to realize this, that the opportunities for evangelism have never been greater. I always share this, and I'm going to share it again. When the night is the darkest, the light shines the brightest, men and women. People come to the end of themselves and realize that they need help. I think of that terrible tragedy just this week of Matthew Perry's death that maybe you read about. He was on the TV show Friends during the 90s. And after that show took place and he continued to live off the residuals of that show, he just, his life was purposeless, a sense of meaningless. He didn't know where to go and he had no friends and he was incredibly lonely. And he died alone in a hot tub by himself and evidently drowned to death. We don't know. But I wish, as I read the report on Matthew Perry's life, I just said, I wish I could have taken him out to coffee. I wish I'd been able to just to sit down and share with him that there was someone who loved him intentionally and purposely and with power and that love would never stop. And that one's name is Jesus. We must work. We must witness in the power of the Holy Spirit while it is still day. Why? Because the night is coming when no one can work. Not only did Jesus foretell the rise of false messiahs, the rise of false teachers, he also prophesied the rise of famines and ethnic warfare around the world. 6, 7, and 8, again, I read it to you. He says this, For nation will rise against nation. The word nation there is ethnos. Ethnic groups will rise against ethnic groups. Kingdoms against kingdoms. There will be famines and earthquakes in various or diverse places. All these are the beginning of birth pangs. You know what birth pangs are. Birth pangs are the signs that a mom is ready to deliver a little baby into the world. So Jesus is basically saying, when you see these things, realize that 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 a a birth of of well <laughs> the preparations for the coming of the kingdom are in process, right? All we need to do is watch Save the Children infomercial to visualize the devastation caused by starvation. I just got a text from pastors in Haiti, and they're, they can't even live in their own neighborhood because gangs have taken over. My pastor friend has moved uh, to another part of the city where he's hoping to find an apartment and looking for food, and another pastor is living in the jungle. Why? Because they can't go back. Their lives are under threat. Today in the Sudan, where children uh, by the millions die, according, according to experts of starvation, there's folks dying in Palestine. There are folks dying. They don't have the food to eat. There are folks in other parts of Africa and other parts of the world who are dying because of starvation. Jesus tells us that famines will multiply prior to his return. Even in Ukraine, there's a ministry that they just get food to people because warfare is treacherous. It cuts off everything. It destroys all the possibilities, deliveries of food and so forth. Uh, in Panama, I just received a note from a pastor friend in Panama, and they have a strike going on, and they can't get gas to travel. They can't get food delivered to stores. And so people are on the edge of struggling even with on the edge of starvation because they don't have opportunity to get foodstuffs in where they need to in the cities. But Jesus told us that famines would multiply prior to his return. In fact, during the tribulation, Revelation chapter 6 verse 8 tells us that one quarter of the world's population will die in the future from famine and from, um, from war during the judgment time of the fourth seal. The tribulation is a time that's yet to come, and I believe it's a literal seven-year period where God will basically step back. 
He will retrieve the Spirit of God from moving, and, and there will literally be all hell will break loose upon the world. You think we got problems now? The Bible says that we need to preach the gospel to the whole world because soon the end will come. When you see the Bible says um, <clears throat> these, these, we see these new trends in warfare taking place all over the world, and it seems to continue to escalate. I mean, now bombs are being dropped by drones. They said a cheap drone can deliver a kill shot. And so uh, we are in the process as a nation of sending, I think it's a package of over $100 billion that our president wants to send to Israel and to Ukraine for basically buying bombs and armament. When will it stop? Our armed forces have never been so spread around the world as peacekeepers uh, as, as they are right now. So, the Bible says that famine will increase and wars will increase. Now, the final sign we have time to look at this morning to declare the coming peace that will invade the planet when Jesus returns is found in verse 14. And that's the rise of fervent Jewish evangelists. It's interesting to me to read re reports of the president of Israel or prime minister, uh, I don't know what Netanyahu's title is, but he's quoting scripture in relationship to the battle that they're involved with. There's a time to go to war. There's a time for peace. And he says, it's the time of war. And I believe that God is working among the Jewish people. The Bible says in verse 14, And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world as a witness to all the nations. And then what? And then the end will come. Now, I know when mission organizations use this verse as a catalyst for their ministry today, but it's really that point of saying, listen, in the midst of the difficulties that lie ahead, the message of the gospel will go and invade all over the globe. The Bible talks about these witnesses going globally during the tribulation period. Um, in Revelation chapter 7, verses 1 through 4, they're called the uh, 144,000 witnesses. Now, these are all the tribes of the children of Israel. They're all Jewish believers, sovereignly sealed by God. They're not Jehovah's Witnesses, all right? But God says that in the future... They will be used by God to bring a harvest of souls that will be, as Revelation 7, 9 says, no one could number of all nations, tribes, and people in tongues. And I will tell you this, that God is moving in might and power around the globe right as we speak. I've stated these numbers before, but every day in Africa, 10,000 people come to faith in Christ. There will be more believers in Africa in the next five to ten years than in any other area of the world. And as I've already stated, our mission work in Africa has resulted in uh, hundreds of people coming to faith in Christ. We are seeing 15 new churches being planted, and we have opportunity for more as some of our evangelists and our master trainers are going into other countries, even from Rwanda, as a base. Okay? God is working around the world. But there will be a set of witnesses redeemed specifically by God for the purpose of, of sharing the gospel during the tribulation period that lies ahead. The Bible says in Matthew 24 that they will be killed. Some, the Bible says that they will be betrayed, they will be hated, but those witnesses who are alive, who endure to the end, will be delivered. In the context, it speaks of a physical deliverance. In other words, they will be saved from the attack of the enemy. They will be ushered in as residents of the kingdom that will be established when the Prince of Peace, the Lord Jesus Christ, returns. And when he returns, he will destroy the devil's ill attempt to establish a counterfeit kingdom through a false Christ and a false prophet. Is the Antichrist alive today? I believe he is. But I also believe that Satan doesn't know the day or the time or the hour when Christ is going to return. So, my logic tells me he's already got somebody waiting in the wings 
Who is that somebody? Now, I've heard preachers down through the years, you know, say, hey, their letter, the letters of their name, and they they refer to a specific number, and and uh, this guy, he's got to be the Antichrist. You know, Hitler had to be the Antichrist. Well, he was the Antichrist. He, he was. He was against Christ, and he came as a replacement for Jesus. And people worshipped him to that place of, of almost giving him that, that title of Messiah. But was he? No, he was a false Messiah. And down through the centuries, there have been individuals who have risen, and they have fallen. Why? Because the time is not yet ready for the establishment of the kingdom. Just as it was when Jesus went to the cross. The Bible says numerous times in the book of John that his time was not yet. His time was not yet. People came to arrest him, but they couldn't grab him because his time was not yet. They wanted to stone him, but they couldn't even find him because his time was not yet. But here we come to John chapter 18, and his time is yet. John 17 at the end of Jesus' intercessory prayer, it's time. And Jesus is arrested and he goes to the cross. But guess what? He rises from the dead three days later and will come again as Savior and King. There will be peace on earth. But the bleakness of God's judgment will come before the blessing of God's kingdom. I want to ask you as we close this morning, are you at peace with God? I know the trials and the difficult difficulties of the days in which we live have caused our hearts to be vacated by peace. <laughs> but God's peace is there. He says, my peace, Jesus says, my peace I give to you. It's a, it's a peace that the world cannot give. It's a peace that the world cannot understand. Are you at peace with God? Is your heart at peace knowing that there are things around you that are out of control, but we belong to a God who is in control, is your heart at peace with God. Do you know the Lord Jesus? I'll never forget listening to Billy Graham, and he wrote that little uh, booklet called Peace with God. And he would always ask people as he closed his message, are you at peace? Do you know the Lord Jesus Christ? Have you put your trust in him? Christ offers himself as the living Savior and King. When does the Bible say that Jesus will return? Does he not return to the earth during the mother of all wars, the battle of Armageddon? The Bible says that no flesh will be saved. In other words, mankind will attempt to man annihil <laughs> annihilate mankind. One pastor once wrote this. He said, wars and rumors of wars are a necessary step to leading to Christ's return. They are one of the labor pains signaling the soon delivery of the Prince of Peace. Have you opened your heart to him? Are you willing to trust him completely right now with what's going on in the world? What's, what, what's going on in your own heart and what's going on in your own home? Will you surrender everything to him and say, Jesus, take over. I want you to be my Savior and my Lord, and he will. He will come in and provide that leadership and the direction and the peace that passes all understanding. Let's pray together. Father, in Jesus' name, I pray for those watching this morning whose hearts have been vacant of peace. We're troubled about what's happening in Israel. We're troubled about the threats of numerous countries who are saying they're going to attack, and we're troubled about the potential of terrorists in our own nation. But Father, I know this, that one day the skies will part and my King will come. And I look forward to the day, we look forward to the day, Lord, when you will come again and establish your peace and your kingdom on this place, in this place. So, Father, until that, come, until that time comes, may we be faithful to make disciples to share the good news of the gospel with our neighbors, our family, and friends. And so we surrender our lives to you. Thank you for dying for us, Jesus. Thank you for raising from the dead. And thank you for being our Lord and Savior who promised to come again. 
and we long for your coming in Jesus' name. And God's people said, amen. God bless you. Thanks for joining me. There will be peace on earth.